Hi, I'm Liza Goitin, and I co-direct the Liberty and National Security Program at the Brennan Center for Justice. For the past few years, I've been researching emergency powers, and I've become convinced that emergency powers are not the right framework for dealing with climate change. I'm no climate denier. Climate change is the single most important and urgent issue that the planet has ever faced. But it doesn't follow that emergency powers are the solution. And I fear that this approach could do more harm than good. To explain my position, I'm going to give a brief overview of emergency powers, focusing mostly on the United States, since that's my primary area of expertise. Emergency powers have existed for hundreds of years in countries all around the world. The idea behind them is pretty simple. Because an emergency is, by definition, unforeseen and unforeseeable, the powers conferred on the government by existing laws might not be sufficient to respond to them. Emergency powers therefore authorize a limited departure from the legal norm. Their purpose is to give governing officials a temporary boost in power until the emergency passes. The vast majority of countries today have constitutions that include special ground rules for emergencies. The US Constitution is an outlier. It has no separate regime for emergencies, nor does it give the president any explicit emergency powers. So presidents have, for the most part, relied on Congress to provide them with enhanced authorities and emergencies. That system currently works like this. The president or Congress, usually the president, declares a national emergency, and that declaration triggers standby authorities contained in 136 different provisions of law, which the Brennan Center has compiled and cataloged on its website. Many of those powers are quite narrow and reasonable on their face but others really do seem like the stuff of authoritarian regimes. For instance, there's a law that allows the president to take over or shut down radio stations and certain other communications facilities. There's another law that allows the president to freeze the US bank accounts and assets of anyone, including Americans, if the president deems it necessary to address a foreign threat. There's even a law that allows the president to suspend the prohibition on government testing of chemical and biological agents on unwitting human subjects. The procedures for declaring a national emergency are set forth in the National Emergencies Act. Under that law, the president just needs to sign and publish an executive order. There are no substantive criteria that have to be met. When emergency declarations have been challenged, courts have generally said they have no authority to second guess the president's determination that an emergency exists. Nonetheless, when President Trump declared a national emergency to secure funding for a wall along the southern border, several people and organizations brought legal challenges which are still ongoing. One of their arguments was that even though the National Emergencies Act doesn't define emergency, the word has a definition, you can find it in the dictionary. And one of the core elements of that definition is that the events giving rise to the emergency have to be unexpected and unforeseen. That's not just a semantic detail or a legal nicety. It's core to the purpose of emergency powers in our constitutional system. Emergency powers often involve an extraordinary transfer of power from Congress to the president. That shift in the normal balance of power is defensible only in situations where Congress lacks the institutional capacity to act because the crisis occurred suddenly and is moving faster than the legislative process can handle. If Congress has had ample time to act and has chosen not to, then emergency powers are not in order. That's the case for climate change. Congress has been on notice for years and has chosen inaction just as it chose not to fund a wall along the southern border. Now, if I thought that shifting power from Congress to the president would rescue the planet, I might just put my constitutional qualms aside. I don't think that's the case, though. Professor Dan Farber at Berkeley Law School has done an excellent job culling through the Brennan Center's research and identifying the handful of powers that might, in theory, be useful for addressing climate change. But when I look at those powers, each of them has some language in the law itself or in the, law, or in the legislative history indicating that it's not an honest fit. And even if these laws could be shoehorned into service, they wouldn't be enough. Combating climate change is going to take a massive investment in renewable energy resources and technologies. None of the emergency 
powers that Professor Farber identified would provide the necessary infrastructure or expertise or most important resources for this endeavor. Now, you might be thinking, what about the symbolism of emergency declarations? We are in the midst of a genuine movement with over 1,700 government units all across the world having declared a climate emergency. Even if those declarations don't unlock relevant powers, and most of them are worded in such a way that they actually don't trigger whatever emergency powers that government might have, they still make a powerful statement. They could help to build and to grow momentum for change. That theory has a lot of intuitive appeal, but it doesn't match up with what studies have shown about the psychology of emergency. Emergency declarations and similar quote unquote fear appeals can be very effective motivators if they are coupled with a clear and simple action plan that will yield immediate visible results allowing people to go back to their normal behaviors. If on the other hand, there is no clear action plan and no foreseeable return to normal, fear appeals have a tendency to lead to fatalism and passivity. There is no quick fix to climate change. We're going to have to make fundamental and permanent changes in the way we live. The emergency frame is ill-suited to this reality. Most important, encouraging emergency declarations could have serious ramifications for individual liberties and rights. In the United States, when a national emergency is declared, the president has access to dozens of emergency powers, including the scary ones I mentioned earlier. It doesn't matter if the declaration talks about climate change, the words national emergency are an automatic trigger for all of those powers. We don't know who's going to be in the White House in one year, in five years, in nine years, and we don't know which powers that person will choose to deploy. In other countries, the risk is even greater. Of the 178 constitutions that provide for states of emergency, 70% allow the head of state to suspend some or all of the rights accorded to the people under the constitution. Only about a quarter of them specify rights that cannot be set aside. And history is full of examples of leaders exploiting real emergencies to consolidate power, suppress dissent, and target minorities. We're seeing that right now with COVID-19. One of the most prominent examples is Hungary, where Prime Minister Viktor Orban acquired the power to suspend elections and rule by decree. But we've seen abuses of emergency powers and erosions of freedom in so many countries, including established democracies as well as autocratic regimes. According to the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law, 40 countries have implemented emergency measures that restrict freedom of expression. Measures like government shutdowns of websites, direct censorship of the press, and criminal penalties for spreading fake news. Other stark trends include ramped up militarization and the adoption of broad and intrusive surveillance practices. COVID-19 might be behind us in a few years. Climate change won't be. Leaders who rely on states of emergency for the power they wield will need a new emergency. We should be in no hurry to offer up climate change. In short, I very much support the goal of injecting a sense of urgency into the political discussion around climate change. But for all the reasons I've laid out, I don't think emergency powers is the answer. Climate change just isn't a sudden, unforeseen event that can be fixed by a temporary exertion of extraordinary executive power. We need a different movement, one that will pressure lawmaking bodies into enacting long-term changes that can create a new normal without setting aside our rights and our liberties. Thank you.